Hello, STEM Nation. Jeff here, and welcome to episode number 88 of STEM on Fire, where we interview practicing professionals in the area of science, technology, engineering, and math, otherwise known as STEM. If you like what you hear, please share it with a friend. Now let's get fired up today with our guest, Stacy, and I hope our chat will help ignite your passion towards a STEM career. Stacy has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and is a past president of the Society of Women Engineers and has worked at Caterpillar for most of her career. Stacy is now an additive manufacturing advisor for the Society of Manufacturing Engineers. Welcome to the show, Stacy. Fill in any gaps and share a bit of your personal life. Thanks. Great to be here, Jeff. Uh, the one thing I do want to share is that as I've left Caterpillar, and yes, I am working with the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, I am right now working on setting up my own LLC to do some consulting and additive. So that'll be the next chapter of my life as an engineer. Awesome. Hey, thanks for being on, Stacy. And let's delve right in. So you've got a chemical engineering degree, but it looks like you are in additive manufacturing. I'm going to say in my simple mind, that is like 3D printing. Can you expand upon what that really means? It is 3D printing. So the uh, specs and standards organizations have taken to calling it additive manufacturing, but it is 3D printing, I'd say, in more common language. And it's really uh, just it, it is a manufacturing technology, so I like to refer to it as additive manufacturing because uh, the world of the future is just going to be another manufacturing process, and it's not going to be its own separate thing kind of like you see it now. And, um, yeah. All right. So from a, from a additive manufacturing, so you've got a chemical engineering degree. And, again, in my simple mind, because my mind is pretty simple, is I'm thinking that's more of a mechanical engineering degree. Can you explain how maybe a chemical engineering or mechanical engineering or even industrial engineering, how that would play in the area of manufacturing for 3D printing? Right. So I worked at Caterpillar for decades, for uh, 30 years, actually. And I have a chemical engineering degree, and typically Caterpillar will hire a lot of mechanical electrical engineers. Uh, so in the course of those 30 years, you can imagine I've had a lot of different jobs that we will get into before then because uh, 3D printing was not even a thing 30 years ago when I had started at the company. Um, but in the course of all that, my experience as a Caterpillar, I did a lot of work in design with non-metallics. And it would be design, processing, like how do we make these plastic or rubber parts and how are they used at Caterpillar, sort of what's the value prop of these smaller components on a big, large piece of equipment. So as it came time to, for Caterpillar to invest in additive manufacturing, my background in the components and on the polymer side is really what made it a good fit. So normally, yes, I would say if you had to pick a type of engineering, you might say, oh, that's a mechanical engineer. But I think the fact that I was chosen for that job with a chemical engineering degree really highlights the fact that it's not all that important what type of engineering you go into because your career is going to evolve so much over the years. Yeah, and, and Stacey, you hit on a, an important point there, right? So 3D printing wasn't even a thing back when you graduated college. You had no idea that that's what you'd be doing towards the, I'll say, towards the latter part of your career. But you you can do these type of jobs almost regardless of the type of engineering or STEM degree that you have, as long as you're willing to continue to learn and evolve and, and pivot along the way. Um, what would be some comments around that? So first of all, absolutely, I agree. I think any type of engineering, it's a technology, it's a technical degree. So there is uh, you know, the, the technology changes, it evolves. Even some of the really basic technologies that have maybe been around for 100 years, there's still new ways to do them. So as an engineer, you have to be willing to stay relevant and current and always learning. And sometimes it will take you in this really different direction like 3D printing that wasn't around, or it could just be new, more efficient ways to to do the work that would have been done uh you know, 100 years ago. So it is, it keeps it really exciting. And I think that's one of the things that's uh, fascinating about engineering is because it is always changing, sometimes at a fast rate, sometimes at a slower rate, but it is always changing. So somebody listening to this podcast, it's like, well, 3D printing or added printing, I've heard about that. That's kind of cool. What would be some ways that they could go off and investigate if that's something they'd really want to do? 
There is so much information out there on the internet, on LinkedIn, on YouTube about 3D printing. Um, if they're just looking at a high level, they might get some of the videos or some of the talk that's more about toys and stuff like that. If they're looking at, hey, I want to know how some of the um, aerospace industry or medical industry or industrial industries using 3D printing, just Google that. I mean, go in and Google um, try additive manufacturing because you'll get more industrial sort of uh, responses than 3D printing, but additive manufacturing in automotive or additive manufacturing in the medical industry. And there is a lot of uh, information online about it, and it'll tell you use cases, some of the new things that's coming out, um, some of the challenges, that sort of thing. So it's a pretty easy field to look into because it is so prevalent on the Internet. All right. And, and Stacy. What What is one thing that we don't know about additive manufacturing that you think would be really interesting for the audience to know? The thing, I swear, every day at work, when I was at Caterpillar and even in industry, I'll reach people that, first of all, didn't know that 3D printing went beyond toys, trinkets, awards, um, you know, something like maybe what they do in Hollywood. But it goes beyond that, and we're actually making – high-grade industrial sorts of parts. There's parts that are being flown in the sky. There's parts that are on engines. They're metal parts that are good quality. So the fact that those parts are out there uh, and being used today is something that I get a lot of people that are amazed about that time after time. And I do say that, and I don't mean that it's ready like, oh, we're going to print everything because that is not the case. But right now, under the proper um, quality guidelines and with the proper application, it is a viable option. In are, metal. In metal. In, in there, metal. Yeah, that, that's pretty amazing, right? I don't think of 3D printing metal. So are there parts that you can actually create with additive manufacturing that you couldn't create any other way? Yes. One of the huge advantages of 3D printing, I would say in metal or plastic, but let's talk metal, is the fact that you can make something that you literally couldn't make any other way. And that's where you're going to see the huge advantage of 3D printing. So let's say that you have a part that is in a high heat application, you know, deep inside an engine or something, and it just gets really hot. And traditionally, you cool something by making sure there's lots of cooling channels and you're putting um, coolant or, you know, something, uh, the heat exchangers in the area in order to cool that down. But you can only do so much with traditional methods. And so you'll either make that cooling more or higher flow or bigger tubes or something. But with 3D printing, you can let your imagination go crazy and you can do all kinds of swirls and different channels. I mean, you can't see me, but I'm using my hands to describe it where you would do channels that kind of swirl around the part that's hot. And a swirl channel, swirl channel is impossible to make with current with any other uh, sort of process other than 3D printing. So if you can swirl it around and take advantage of all the available space that's out there to cool it, all of a sudden you can make that part live longer because it's not going to get so hot. Right, Stacy, And I'm going to pivot a little bit here. I'm going to move over to you are a, a, a past president of the Society of Women Engineers. So STEM Nation that's out there, think juniors and seniors in high school, they're not even aware of these type of organizations that exist. How important do you think it is for them to start getting involved in these organizations, you know, let's say freshman year in college? I think it's really important. I will tell you, I was not involved in college. I didn't get involved until a couple years into my um, my professional career. And the value of being involved in college or even having the exposure in high school is that, first of all, you see people that are doing it. You get to meet those people. So you realize they're just average people. There's nothing special about them. And, and you start to feel like, well, if Stacy did this, Stacy seems pretty normal. If Stacy did it, I can do it too. And then you've got somebody who has a lot of connections. They've seen different things. They can let you know, oh, that's normal. Don't worry about it. Or if somebody, um, you know, if they've got a hard class or they don't know what class to take or maybe they're really, really, really stressing about what kind of engineering to go into, somebody that they meet in something like a Society of Women Engineers can help them navigate that and help them understand, oh, that's not a big deal or, oh, let's talk about that because we really want to make sure that you know what you're getting into. Yeah, and I think that goes along with, you know, try to build that network early and often in your, as soon as you start 
you know, actually in high school, start building out that, yeah. start building out that network. And you know, STEM Nation, Stacy's got a ton of history, a ton of background, chemical engineering, going in through manufacturing. So if you if you want to touch base with Stacy, she's on LinkedIn. Her LinkedIn profile is on the show notes at stemonfire.com. Just search for Stacy. And her LinkedIn profile will be there. Click on that and look into her background if you want to, you know, go connect with Stacy. All right. Hey, and Stacy, now we're going to move on to something that really has you fired up today in the area of additive manufacturing, SWE, whatever it is. Something that has me really fired up is just the use cases. So people on... In 3D printing, they get they either get really excited about it and they think, oh, we can print anything, or they're like, oh, this is like going to happen in the future. It's 10 years too soon, you know, not good enough for us type of thing. And what really gets me excited is that it is relevant right now. It's relevant right now as long as it's the right use case. And it really goes back to that design aspect of it. When I think of some of the medical applications where you can customize uh, medical devices specifically for a human body, because we're all individuals, it makes it so much more um, comfortable and applicable because it's been customized for a person. So really that customization, that design for additive, so using something that's actually been designed for additive versus just taking a part that's um, been around for 20 years and saying, oh, we're going to print this. I mean, they're it's potentially a reason why you do that, but I'm more excited about the things that have been designed specifically with the technology in mind. All right. Thanks for that, Stacy. And it is story time. So we're looking for a story of an aha moment you've had and maybe turn that into success, something that you think STEM Nation would be interested in. All right. So I know a lot of people have their aha moment early in their career, but mine came later in my career. And it had been when I had just started doing 3D printing and we had an executive that was so supportive and really into it, which is kind of fun. And it was around the time, probably 2016, 2015, and a company called Made in Space had just sent a 3D printer up to the International Space Station and they had printed something up there, which is pretty neat. So there's a lot of, you know press information about that. So this executive called me or he sent me an email or something. And he said, oh, are we working with this company? And I'm thinking this company is focused on how do we 3D print in microgravity or zero gravity environments? And at the time I worked for Caterpillar. And I, and when he asked me that, I just was like, I thought it was the stupidest thing. I'm like, no, we're not working with this company <laughs> that's working on low gravity environment. And, you know, I tried to be like, uh, nice about it and not say like, oh, heck no, but um, anyway, so, so he did that. And shortly after that, I actually was had dinner with another gentleman who was kind of in the innovation space. And he said, you're working for Caterpillar. And if you think long term and we're going to be mining on Mars or we're going to be, you know, mining on these planets that have microgravity, of course, Caterpillar wants to figure out how to work in that environment and 3D printing may be an option. And so this, so it was, it was such an aha moment because I was like, oh my gosh, that probably wasn't a stupid question. Like, are we working with this maiden space company? Because I was not thinking big enough. So I totally had certain um, limits around my brain, thinking this is what Caterpillar makes today, and this is how we would use 3D printing today. Versus fast forwarding 20 years, which is the horizon he would be talking about and thinking that, oh, well, maybe we would want to print in microgravity because if someone's going to mine on Mars, it's probably going to be Caterpillar. And so it was this big aha moment about I'm really thinking to my box is too small. Yeah, or anything, out of the box. A absolutely. And Stacey, I think that's that's a problem that a lot of folks have. Right. You get so, so tuned into what you're doing, so focused on the day and just grinding it out and grinding it out. And you get other people like, I'll just say like an executive space where they're trying to think out 20 years right. out and the way they're thinking is differently. And they come ask a question. It's like, oh, that's a dumb question, right? That's a just, I do that too, right? It's a knee jerk reaction. And you sit back and you go, oh, wow. Okay. Well, boy, my box was small. I really need to open up my box and expand that. Right. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. All right, Stacy, and it is college time. So going back to when you're heading off to college, what are some things that you wish you knew back then that you think would help STEMers get through college successfully? 
I wish I would have taken some more risks. And um, so by that, I, I went to University of Cincinnati that is a mandatory co-op school. So you have to co-op in order to graduate. And because of that, they are very vested in finding you a job, which is great. But I, w- I was really, once again, very much in this safe mode. I wanted to stay someplace close to my hometown. Um, I It was all about trying to be in more of a safe environment and I wish I would have just kind of spread my wings a little bit because that's a really easy time to do it a co-op is just a couple months long if you don't like something fine you know you just aren't going to go back there and I wish I would have uh, sort of spread my wings more at that time of my life so let's say Stacy that you did spread your wings back then and you and you didn't stay in your comfort zone what do you think some differences might have been I think I would have found my voice a little bit earlier. Uh, My voice was very much dependent on me having confidence in what I could do and what my skills were. And it took me a while in my professional career to find that confidence. And I think had I spread my wings a little bit more when I was in college, that might have happened sooner. All right. And Stacey, we're going to take a quick pause to thank our sponsor, Audible. They are offering a free audiobook, so you can head to stemonfirebook.com. That's stemonfirebook.com to get a free audiobook of your choosing. If you decide to cancel within 30 days, there's no cost, and you keep the audiobook. And what comes up next is the lightning round. Stacey, are you ready? I am ready. Your best piece of advice that you've ever received. I had a manager once who told me, in essence, be present. And what he meant by that was if you're going to go to a meeting, you're going to go to a workshop, you need to be there, you need to engage, you need to not multitask, you need to participate. And in this day and age of multitasking and bringing a computer and doing something while you're sitting in a meeting or on a call or something like that is very common. And I always go back to that device of if I'm taking the time to physically be there, I'm going to take the time to be involved and get the most out of it. Yeah, I'm going to add a little add to that. I usually don't add to lightning round. But, you know, in the meetings, if you find yourself doing other work, then you should ask yourself, why am I even in this meeting? Oh, great. Yes, agree. And a personal habit, Stacy, that contributes to your success. I like to think that I'm good at shutting down when things get uh, too much or, or, you know, finding something to help myself relax. So I have always been an avid reader. And even at times in my life or my career when it's been a little crazy and I've traveled a lot, I've had a lot going on, I've always read a lot. And it could be based on the situation, you know, if it's something that I really want to de-stress on, it's a pretty light book, it's fiction, it's pretty easy. Or, you know, if it's something where I'm excited about it, I can apply it to work. It might be a little bit deeper book. But I've always been a a heavy reader, and it's really served me well throughout my life. And if you had to pick one internet resource or phone app, what would that be? It would be Goodreads. I have this whole reading theme going on here. So Goodreads is a a book, is is an app where you can go and you can say what books you've read, what books you want to read. And then after you've read them, you can rate them and you can say like, oh, I started it January 1st and finished it February 1st. And so I can go and I can see what my friends are reading or when I'm listening to one of your podcasts and somebody says, oh, this is a great book. I can pull up Goodreads and put it in there and put it in my want to read list. All right. And this next question I know is going to be challenging for you because I'm going to ask just for one book (laughs) that you would recommend. Not 25, not 50, just one. So one book. I know I wanted to give more than one. One book, I would say The Notorious RBG. And uh, I just read it about oh, six months ago. And uh, RBG is a Supreme Court justice and this huge advocate for women. And I don't know how I didn't know about her until several months ago, especially because I am such a women's advocate. And so I highly recommend it. It's a great read. It's an easy read. And I loved it. All right, Stacey. And all that stuff will be up on the show notes. You can go to stemonfire.com up to Stacey's podcast and all those links will be there. And we are going to close down here, Stacey, but we always ask for a parting piece of guidance for STEM Nation, and we'll say goodbye. If you don't know what you want to do, that's okay. I went into engineering not knowing at all what engineering was, and I didn't have some grandiose thing where I was going to save the world or invent some great piece of technology, but I just, I liked science 
And I went into engineering and I think it's okay if you don't know that. I get so worried about people going off to college and they they spend a lot of time trying to figure out what the perfect major is, but there's probably no perfect major and that's okay. You can still be a success. All right. Thanks for that, Stacy. And with that, we will say goodbye. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Stacy. I hope you enjoyed that chat today with Stacy. You can head over to stemonfire.com, subscribe to the email list to keep up with the latest happenings and be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite co- podcast player and share with a friend. Until next time, I hope this chat has helped ignite your passion in STEM.